exorcism. My name is Ju Young Lee. I am a training child and adolescent psychiatrist in Harvard Medical School at Cambridge Health Alliance. This video is created to help viewers learn more about child development. Personal disclosure, I also have a young child. Creating this video, I wish I could have had this knowledge earlier. Many caregivers are familiar with when children generally start to smile, talk, or run. So my videos, rather, focus on child development, paying special attention to child's inner world. I hope this video will help child caregivers to understand their children better, to fine tune their caregiving style based on the child's development, and most of all, to enjoy their time together more. From birth, Infant's development occurs within the caregiving relationship. Babies teach their caregivers what they want and what they need through their behavior. The famous Boston pediatrician T. Barry Brazelton said, The language of infants is their behavior. They show the wish to connect with the caregiver through smiling and gazing and reaching out. And they show the need to take a break or the need for comfort by turning away, fussing, or crying. At birth, newborns experience a profound neurophysiological transition as they attempt to adjust to life outside the womb. Out in the new world, newborns have only limited ability to regulate their own basic functions. They need help regulating their temperature, being nourished, comforted from overwhelming stress of the outer world. Sensitive, responsive caregiving during the earlier days is so critical. You wonder why? Because the foundation for the core competencies needed for future success are being laid in the first thousand days of life. Now it is time to talk about baby self-regulation. Self-regulation! A big word alert! Huh, Johnny. Yeah, it's a big word, huh? Allow me to explain. So regulation is a process that maintains the state of well-being by controlling the amount of stimulation coming in and modulating the degree of arousal. Most adults have a set of skills to regulate themselves. How about infants? Their ability to self-regulate is not mature, especially under stress. In early infancy, regulation of distress is primarily a mutual process. Learning how to read newborn's behavior cues can help parents respond sensitively to their infant's needs. If the infant's needs are met by the caregiver responsibly and predictably in a good enough manner, the baby learns there will be a food comfort within a certain time period. Then the baby learns that the world is a safe place and can develop the ability to wait. Johnny, can you come up and explain how they comfort themselves? Ha! Dr. Lee wanted Johnny! Okay, first, sucking a thumb, looking at a caregiver's face, looking at a favorite toy, or Looking away when things are too stimulating. Ha 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 ha. Early in their life, newborns depend on the mirroring and empathic responses of the caregivers. Mirroring! Empathic responses! Another big word alert! What are those? Don't be overwhelmed. I thought Johnny would come up. I'll give you an example. When interacting with a distressed infant, the caregiver's face and demeanor naturally reflect emotions that the infant is likely to have. The caregiver does not directly mimic the infant's crying, which can make the infant more anxious. Rather, the caregiver puts on a recognizable but more playful version of the infant's experience. This mock sad pouting, like this, can buffer the infant's stress. We call this, hey Johnny, 
What do you call this? A marked expression! Yes. It requires the caregiver to be well enough regulated to receive the infant's message and to empathize with the infant. Also, caregivers interact with the infant in a rhythmic way, as if they're taking turns. Just like in conversation, caregivers wait for the infant's responses and then often comment on them. Empathic responses of the caregivers scaffold the infants so that they can work on calming themselves. Then what happens when empathic responses are lacking? I'll tell you about the famous still face experiment. Mother and the baby sit in a face-to-face -face position. The mother is asked to play with the baby as usual and then at the signal to make an unresponsive still face like this. Dr. Lee, you look freaking scary! Ah! Initially, the infants become confused. They increase their effort to engage their mothers by smiling, cooing, and gesturing. When the mother continues to be unresponsive, the infant becomes distressed and even physiologically upset. This experiment shows that the infants need caregivers' responsive engagement to self-regulate. Later, with maturation and practice, the infant will grow in its capacity to self-regulate. Let's now talk about how early infants play. The baby games played in this period are mostly initiated by the caregivers, not by the babies. You know games such as peek a and I'm gonna get ya! During the play, Caregivers naturally use exaggerated speech and gestures, just like I did, to help their infants become aroused just about the right amount. When infants are way too aroused and want to play a different game or take a break, they'll give you a cue to express themselves. Surprising, right? They do it by turning their heads away, crying, and frowning. Now you know it's not a good idea to tease a baby until the baby cries, right? Sensitive caregivers can give in, for example, by revealing themselves in the game of peekaboo before the baby feels helpless. Babies can play these games, such as peekaboo, without the need for language. They learn the repeated pattern and join the adult in the game. As the babies mature, they can begin to initiate the moves of the game and enjoy his agency in hiding and finding the parent's face. Let's think about what are the reasons that prevent caregivers from responding to infant cues. Caregivers' unresolved past trauma may distort their views about the distressed babies. There is a very famous phrase that psychoanalyst Selma Freiberg named. Oh, Johnny, do you remember that? Of course! This is my favorite part! It's called Ghost in the Nursery! Even though Johnny was so excited about the ghost, actually it's quite frightening. Let's assume that there is a caregiver who suffered from childhood neglect. This caregiver may view their own newborn as non-stop demanding and just tune out the newborn's emotional signals or even become aggressive angry at the baby. How about a caregiver who was raised by a violent parent? This caregiver may experience her infant's cry as a critical attack on them. These ghosts of the past can prevent the caregivers from properly hearing what their babies are telling them. But these ghosts of the caregiver can be exercised. Exorcism! You wonder how? is with the help of a therapist, a trusted friend, or a family member, with their past struggles genuinely heard by one of these people, the caregiver's distorted view about their infant's behavior can be corrected, and eventually the caregivers can begin to see their real babies. As infants head toward the six month of mark in their lives, 
they become less dependent upon immediate responsiveness from their caregivers. They can wait briefly without requiring immediate attention. Normal infants cry much less thanks to improved self-regulation. But some infants remain harder to comfort or stay colicky. This difficult temperament style usually does not persist across childhood. Oh, Dr. Lee, that's a, such a good news that you let the audience know about that, because Johnny was once a very colicky kid, and I grow out of it. Really, Johnny? Nevertheless, some caregivers may show frustration or anger to the infant's constant fussiness. They may handle the infant roughly, emotionally withdraw, or leave the baby to cry it out. Unfortunately, these behaviors may worsen the baby's already challenging irritability. Therefore, the caregivers of these difficult infants, or orchid infants as opposed to dandelion infants, should have several calming techniques in their tool belt. These techniques include, let Johnny explain. Ha! <laughs> so the techniques include picking up and rocking or walking with the baby and swaddling tight with the blanket or giving the baby something to suck such as a pacifier. Using one sensory modality at a time is also helpful, meaning like speaking to the baby without showing him your face or show him your expressive face without speaking. Or instead of talking and jiggling your baby, the caregivers can just talk while holding the baby still. So this comes to the end of this episode. In the next episode, Johnny, can you explain what we're going to do next episode? Ha! In the next episode, we will find out more about infants who become more interested in the world that lies beyond the caregiver's face and body. This episode is written by myself and edited by my supervisor and colleague, Dr. Alexandra Harrison. She is a host of the Supporting Child Caregivers podcast, which check out the podcast to learn more about child caregiving tips shared by Dr. Harrison and her guests. I am currently a trainee at CHA Cambridge Hospital and Boston Psychoanalytic Society and Institute. Put a link to my training program in the descriptions below for those who need it. Please note that in this video, I'm not speaking on behalf of any of my training institutions. This video is not sponsored by any organization or institutions. Oh, Dr. Lee, are you insinuating something? No, Johnny, please behave. If you happen to love this video, please click the link in the description to complete a brief survey about this video. That'll mean a lot to me and Johnny. Johnny! And help me create more of these contents. Please share this video with your family and friends who are child caregivers themselves. Because sharing is caring! For real, bye now! I'm a training child. When the mothers continue to be unresponsive, infants become distressed and even psychotic.